land ownership status, different religions was illegal, and it really wasn't so long ago when in this country it was illegal to marry somebody of a different race. Students, how many people have uh, parents over the age of 45? Almost all. If you just raised your hand or you're over the age of 45 yourself, you have a parent who is a, not a grandparent or a great-grandparent, a parent who was alive when in this country, interracial marriage was illegal in 18 states. 40% of this country had laws in the books banning interracial marriage. This is to say that interracial marriage and same-sex marriage are the exact same thing. They're not, although you obviously can have an interracial same-sex marriage, and that makes some people very angry. <laughs> but the process by which interracial marriage and then same-sex marriage first became socially acceptable and then legally recognized, that process is the exact same. So I would want to simply remind everybody that we are not asking people to do something new or something radical, something that we haven't done before. The reason that interracial marriage is now perfectly acceptable and that same-sex marriage is increasingly acceptable is because we have evolved and we have grown in our understanding of what it means to be married and more fundamentally of what it means to be human. And that is exactly what we're doing today. So with the rest of my time uh, this morning, I'd like to simply hit on a couple of key areas. I want to talk a little bit more about this dialogue, this debate, conversation, whatever you want to call it that we're currently having. I want to talk a little bit about what you guys can do, what we can all do as young people to go home and have these conversations. How many people are going home for the holidays? How many of you are going back to small towns, or towns smaller than 100,000 people? Quite a few. Uh, so the ability that, that you have to have conversations with friends, family, peers, coworkers, people who go to your church is enormous. And I would, I would implore you to talk about uh, this issue with some of your friends, your family, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit more after I'm done speaking. Molly Tafoya, the, the brilliant communications director for Iowa, uh, is going to come up here and talk a little bit more about the Home for the Holidays program. I believe they have some kits that they'll be handing out uh, that are right up here. Uh, and, and so we're going to walk you through what these conversations look like. Uh, and then after that, I'll come back up and, and answer some questions, and then you guys can just get on the rest of your day. How's that sound? So, uh, there are three key observations I'd like to make uh, about this, this dialogue. Before I get to those, I just want to kind of preempt this by saying I've gone all over the country. I've spent the last 22 months of my life more or less nonstop traveling, speaking, talking, doing advocacy work, and listening to people. And I want to simply remind everybody in this room that by the very virtue of being here, talking with me, talking with one Iowa, you are part of this dialogue, too. This is not some abstract thing happening on cable news. This is it, right here. Uh, this country has gotten through incredible challenges in the past. The founding revolution, slavery, women's rights, two world wars, the Great Depression, you know, the, the brink of nuclear Armageddon of the Soviet Union. But we got through it all because we were willing to have conversations with each other and talk about these things and exchange ideas. And this isn't some foreign thing. This is happening right here, right now. And we're asking you to continue the conversation after you leave this room today. Uh, but my three observations uh, about this the debate dialogue are pretty straightforward. The first, this is a, a really awkward topic. Right? How many people know someone who's divorced? Everybody. So marriage can be kind of awkward anyway. But then combine that with politics, religion, and sex, and then tie it all up in a big gay bow. <laughs> like, I, I understand why this is not the most comfortable Thanksgiving meal conversation. Right. It can be awkward, you know, your uncle who watches Fox News and is really conservative and probably doesn't spend a whole lot of his spare time thinking about this issue for reasons that, frankly, I totally understand. Right. It's going to be awkward. And obviously there are a few notable exceptions do spend an awful lot of their time thinking about this issue, like Mr. Vanderplatz or Mr. Santorum, uh, for reasons that I'm not going to speculate on. There's no bottle of water. There is? Cool. Um, reasons I'm not going to speculate on. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so there you go. 
Uh, off our topic. Number two, uh, this is a dialogue that, we, that if we're not very careful, can really be driven by fear. So this fear for the folks like Mr. Santor or Mr. Van Vlaat, so this fear, so this assault on tradition, this assault on normal, uh, this assault on, on common sense, on traditional values, on family values. I think perhaps you know, more fundamentally, uh, an assault on their religious heritage. Now, obviously, those of us who support LGBTQ rights, and I won't presume that everybody in the room does, uh, but those of us who do don't see it that way. Uh, but folks who do oppose LGBT rights see this disagreement as assault. And they see a different opinion as uh, an attempt to undermine their own beliefs. And this uh, disagreement, because our religious beliefs are so fundamental to so many of us, can really seem like a direct attack on, on you as an individual, because separating your religious beliefs from who you are as a person is, is very difficult to do. Then, of course, there's the fear, on the other hand, the fear that I experienced when I was in the eighth grade, watching Rick Stage Forum address the nation, the Republican National Convention, uh, railing about how same-sex marriage was this threat uh, to the United States of America, how gay activists were trying to undermine this sacred institution that, that children growing up without a mother and a father would be somehow uh, deficient or, or, or you know, deprived or, or whatever else. And I remember being really scared because if not having you know a mother and a father was so dangerous, so unhealthy, like was the government going to come in and, and scoop me up and put me in a home where I would have a mom and a dad? I didn't know and it was scary. Uh, there's the fear that people like my parents felt growing up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, when homosexuality, if you were gay or lesbian or God forbid transgender, you were sick. You had a mental disease, a disorder to be treated. You'd be put into a mental institution, subjected to therapy, electroshock, reparative therapy. And if that didn't work, a lobotomy. We have to remember, too, that electroshock preparative therapy has not gone away. In fact, it was just October 2012, not even a full two months ago, that the state of California finally banned gay electroshock reparative therapy for minors. Two months ago, in the state of California, if you were under the age of 18 and you were gay, your parents could have taken you to a mental institution where they would try to shock the gay out. Not Oklahoma or Mississippi. California. Think about that first. It's scary stuff. Uh, and so when we have this, this debate, this dialogue, the fear is always there and always threatening to encroach on our thought process. And what happens when we get scared? Fight or flight, the most basic biological response kicks in. And there's literally less blood flowing to your brain. Having you know rational conversations becomes very very difficult, and uh, we do all kinds of unhelpful things. The third uh, piece of this debate that I want to just briefly comment is a lot of emotional baggage. There are a lot of labels that get thrown around. Did anybody see the whole uh, kerfuffle about Chick Fil A over the summer? <laughs> yeah, on Facebook, Twitter, uh, even like regular media. It was ridiculous. Um, now, I, I realize that Chick-fil-A is not really a big deal here in Iowa. Um, there's, like, I think a grand total of three in the entire state. Uh, but you, know, you go down to, you know, I've spoken to South Carolina, Kentucky, Texas. There's one literally every other block. It's weird. Uh, <laughs> weird, if you will. Uh, but but it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal down there. And so I remember watching this debate on, on my Facebook and on my Twitter. And, and seeing people going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. If you supported Chick-fil-A, you were an ignorant, bigoted redneck. And if you opposed Chick-fil-A, you were a godless, colonizing sodomite. <laughs> and there really wasn't much room in the middle for those of us who just don't care about chicken sandwiches. <laughs> and I think that probably describes most of us, am I right? <laughs> so I, I remember watching this dialogue and just being really frustrated because it reminded me of something that my high school debate coach had taught me. Uh, when, when I was a little bit younger. Never argue with an idiot, because he will drag you down to his level and then beat you with experience. <laughs> <laughs> kind of brilliant when you think about it. Uh, but the same is true 
for the politics of fear and division. When as a community, as a nation for that matter, we let ourselves succumb to this base level of discourse and just throw these words at each other and sling mud and the whole thing, it doesn't get anywhere and frankly it alienates a lot of folks who are trying to make up their mind. There's a reason why during political campaigns uh, these, these, these politicians will run super vicious negative attack ads. It suppresses voter turnout. The same is true by proxy here. When we have these really nasty conversations, we drive away the people who we need to be having these conversations with. But if you know, you're know you still kind of undecided, you don't want to be called a bigot. You don't want to be called hateful. And you know, if engaging in this conversation means that's a possibility, you're not going to want to engage in the conversation. So uh, I would simply implore everybody in the room, when you have these dialogues, be positive. Talk about the things that matter most. Talk about the reasons we're having this conversation in the first place. I'm not standing up here talking with you guys today trying to put Chick-fil-A out of business. I'm just not interested in that. I don't care about Chick-fil-A. What I care about is love and family and the commitment that my parents have and the protections that they have to make sure they can safeguard that commitment to protect and raise our family. And that's why we're here and that's why we're speaking. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit more, and if there are any individual questions, by the way, about some of the arguments you hear during the debate, uh, feel free to ask for any q and I found this a much better place to kind of go back and forth and talk about these individual arguments. I've also got a pretty good joke about pirates, Rick Santorum, and global warming. So <laughs> feel free to ask me about that as well. Um, there's a lot of questions that I tend to get when, when people have this dialogue with me. Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd go through some of those very quickly and then turn it over to Molly. Um, now, the most common question I'll get from guys my age, dude, you have lesbian parents? It's not actually a question, it's actually what I just said. Dude, are they hot? Is it that really awkward moment where you just ask me if my parents are hot? Right? Uh, and, and also, like, it, it kind of feeds into this like super hypersexualization of lesbian